We are on location here at Port Royal Speedway, and joining Steve and I is Bobby Davis Jr. Bobby, uh, we've got your uh, famed Weikert beef mobile here, and I want to kick it off real quick. We're going to talk about Bob Weikert, of course, but I want to start with something that was extremely unique on your sprint car. It was Mrs. Beef. <laughs> talk a little bit about what she meant to you growing up. Uh, everybody knew who Bob Weikert was, but you had a special relationship with Winnie. Yes, ma'am, I did. And um, as you can see, or we don't have a really good picture of it right now, but all the other race cars have always had Mr. Beef on the hood, going down the nose of the hood. And um, I always tease Mr. P Mr. Weikert, we called him Pappy, I always tease Mr. Weikert that I was going to put Mrs. Beef on our car, on, on the car I was driving. He said, no, you can't do that, you can't do that. So when the sign painter showed up to put the name on it and letter the car, I said, look, you have got to put Mrs. Beef on it. I said, that's who I deal with. <laughs> that's, that's who, uh, you know, Pappy just, you know, me and him are just, you know, partners in this thing and everything. But we deal with Miss Winnie on everything, you know, like the winnings, uh, ordering parts or getting permission to get parts. And, and uh, so I was, I was fortunate enough to put Miss, Miss Beef on my car. And uh, I, I really like that. I always tease him about it. Well, yeah, she was also that, but you were a 19-year-old kid, and I understand you had some meals at the table that she prepared, too, and that probably was as important as anything else. <laughs> well, let me tell you, I got in trouble one night. very first time we went to Mr. Weikert, Miss Winnie's house, to have, they invited us to have me and my girlfriend at the time. She's my wife now, but at the time, it was my girlfriend. And uh, they invited us to have steak. They was going to cook it. So uh, they got the steaks out. They cooked them right in front of us and everything. And, and they just have, they drink water and have one piece of white bread and a big steak from the Weikert Livestock stock, uh, right. stock. And I said, and my silly little self said, Pappy, do you have any ketchup? And he said, boy, don't you ever ask for no ketchup to eat my steak. So I don't. I learned right then to eat his steak just like he cooks. And I said, yes, sir, I am terribly sorry. And it was delicious. It was delicious. <laughs> that is phenomenal. We have heard so much about the table at, at Bob's house and how much has gone down there, whether it was dinners or meetings or whatever it may be. Talk about what that table and sitting down with the family always meant to you. Well, you know, when I come up here, I was 19 years old, and I got to stay at the house with uh, – well, one of the daughters, and her name was Betsy, and uh, right down the street from the shop. Now, this is probably a little different story than what you just asked me, but she would get, cook breakfast in the morning, lunch for uh, lunch, and then dinner for dinner for all the working crews out in the barn and the, in the field taking care of the cows and everything. Well, there I was. I, was, I got to eat sausages, hot dogs. I mean, it was, it was awesome. And then all I had to do was just drive – half a mile down the road go to work at the shop so she was she was really 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 good to me took care of me and uh i, I really miss that you know that was that was a great time of my life and um i don't know they're just they're really good and but you know it's just a big family they have eight kids you know so uh well, and you're not a you're not from Pennsylvania. You were from Memphis, Tennessee, um, and coming into Central Pennsylvania, did you basically live at the Weikerts then? That way, it was just easy for you to work on things at the shop and then head on the road to travel to whatever racetrack you were going to that weekend. Yes, ma'am. Mister Mister Weikert uh, let me live in one of his older houses he had on a farm, and uh, believe it or not, Todd Weikert lives in that one now. They remodeled it and everything after I left, and but it was great. Had. Every one of his houses has a humongous grandfather clock. I mean, as tall as this ceiling, they're like three foot wide, the biggest thing you've ever seen in your life. They're beautiful. And um, it was just adorable. Uh, open doors, just take care of you. Anything you need. Gave me a vehicle to drive. I didn't have to drive the race truck. You know, gave, me, gave my wife a car. He gave my wife a car to drive her. I mean, great, great people. For a 19-year-old, you were living living bad. large. I was, I was. You know, I thought I was just Elvis Presley or something. Indeed, indeed. The interesting thing for me is, uh, and you shared with us on the stage, the beginning of the Weicker relationship came from a terrible day at a racetrack for you uh, in Springfield. Uh, tell us about that day and, and, and how you ultimately got started with Bob Weicker. 
Uh, yes, sir. We was at. Uh, I met Mr. Weikert for the first time at Springfield, uh, Illinois, at the uh, at the mile, and um, they was racing their car. Matter of fact, it's not that car, but uh, one of the one of the older cars. Keith Kaufman was driving it. And um, we had a really bad day. We we blow the motor in the heat race. We had to change motors. We had to run the B main. We broke a rear end in the B main. We had to change the rear end. And we did all this in time, and we still made the A feature. The Jacob slider broke during the B main, so it tore the, the rear end out of the car. But I was able to finish like two laps to go. So I transferred, made A main. I believe we ended up running fifth that day. It was a World Outlaw race. And uh, it was the first time I was ever there. So the bottom line was we had a lot of stuff laying out on the side of the trailer. It looked like a junkyard because we, we done tore up so much stuff. But we did put it back together and was able to, to finish the race that day. So we decided that, okay, Little Springfield is, is a little bitty, I mean, a third mile, quarter mile. It's real little, high bank. And uh, we decided to go there for Sunday night. This was Sunday at the mile. We decided to go there for Sunday night. So we went over there. And uh, we did good in the heat race. We made it through the, uh, the heat race fine. And believe it or not, we won the feature. But coming for the checkered flag, two cars in front of me wrecked really bad. And they was flipping. And when they was flipping, of course, I was coming for the checkered flag. And they all landed right on top of me. Oh, my God. So it tore the nose wing up, it tore the hood up, it tore the wing up, it just everything. So we just piled all that junk on top of the trailer because it just looked like we was in a junkyard. So the next morning, Mr. Weikert gets up, and we was, believe it or not, we were staying at the same uh, motel. So my trailer and his trailer was parked next to each other at the motel. And um, he got up the next morning. He said, oh, my God. That kid had a rough day and a rough night. So he was eating breakfast, and he reads the newspaper. He said, Bobby Davis Jr. wins Little Springfield Sunday night. He said, oh, my God, he won the race. You know, but we had a pile of junk. <laughs> so we had a really rough day. And um, believe it or not, from that point on, there was a gentleman named Ken Jenkins at Gambler Chassis Company that we, uh, I was involved with that we got our race cars from. And uh, Gambler Chassis Company at that time, 1982, they kind of got started. I had one of the first cars when I drove for my father. And we had a great relationship with them. And, and Kenny Jenkins knew Mr. Weikert really well. And um, those two got together and offer, off, you know, put a deal together for me to get with Mr. Weikert. But that, that one race is what really set it off. Really, really great stuff. And, and you mentioned Keith Kaufman. Um, Bob fielded a car for both of you at the same time there at one point. And Keith, very prominent in this area, uh, his hometown. What was it like um, working with Keith? You were He was a veteran at that point. You were uh, 19 years old. What was it like working with him? Did you guys kind of play a lot of information off of each other? Well, that's correct. Uh, when I come up here late in 1982, Keith was driving one of the cars, and then they – had two cars, so I started driving the other one. Uh, we had two trucks, two trailers. We had Mr. Weicker at that time. I was using a little old ramp truck that they had. And um, But, yes, we we didn't really – they let me do my thing, and they and, and Mr. Hinchy, uh Dick Hinch, was mechanic for Keith Kaufman, local gentleman here, really good, very nice. And I'd like to thank them, too, because I had to live with them for a little while when I got started because uh, that family was great to me, too. And believe it or not, they was really good. They took care of me. And um, But, yes, they took care of their stuff, and I kind of took care of my stuff. And, it, you know, we had, we had issues uh, with the, you know, we didn't get to finish every race. Stuff was breaking and stuff. But we had a rough half of the 82 year. But Keith was really good. You know, he's won a lot of races here at Port Royal, Williams Grove. Yes, ma'am, he has. And he's uh, he was one of the guys I always beat up here. What was it like? Because, you know, you're talking Keith Kaufman and Lynn Paxton and, and Smokey Snellbaker, and you're, you're coming into a Hall of Fame. You're literally, when you come to central Pennsylvania, you're coming into uh, to, to a Hall of Fame-type area, and you're the 19-year-old kid, but you're in Bob Weikert's car. 
what what was that like as a as a kid coming in here with with all of that? You know, I, I, probably back then I'm not even sure. Yeah. Seriously, and I might not even really known who Lynn Paxton and Keith Kaufman was at that time. All I knew is from where I started racing and following the Outlaws at my beginning. Uh, the first race I ever raced a sprint car was a World Outlaw race in Houston, Texas. First time I ever sat in one. <laughs> yes, sir. So. I didn't really know or think about that. All I, all I really had on my mind, believe it or not, was just winning and focus and, and all the hard work that we put into it. That's, that's, I, I, didn't even, I, I can't even say I even recognized that. Mm. Um, but as I got to know Lynn and how nice of a gentleman he was and Keith, and then I was, you know, all the history that they've had at that time, I said, wow, you know, this pretty heavy hitters, you know. So, um, you know. Maybe your head gets a little big. I don't know. But uh, I try to stay calm about it all. And just all I knew is I wanted to how how much tradition the Wiker car had. And I said, this is going to be great. You know, the, I want to keep this going. We t you talk about that focus and that drive. And, you know, we always talk about how that makes a guy so successful. And you and I had chatted earlier. We talked about your hero being Duff, Doug Wolfgang. And he was very much the same way, very driven. People had their opinions about him, but he was a good race car driver. And you talked about him kind of taking you under his wing. What was it like working with him and the relationship that you two created? And what did you really gain from him at knowledge-wise? Uh, yes, ma'am, that is true. Uh, he definitely took me underneath his wing. And, and Wolfie, would not, uh, Wolfie wouldn't lie to you. You know, some of the other guys say, okay, this little kid, he's coming up here. He's going to be pretty fast. You, you know, let's don't tell him too much because we don't need him in the way. You know, this is going to take another spot. We're going to be running fifth or sixth or now he's going to be running third or, or winning or whatever it might be. But Wolfie, Wolfie was a straight guy. Uh, back then he was driving for Doug Howell and Miss Howell. They was great. Even those two helped. You know, the whole little team helped. Um, but Wolfie, even today. He'll he'll tell you he'll tell you what's on his mind, and he'll be truthful with you. He he's a great guy, you know. Behind the scene, he was dedicated. He gave one hundred and twenty percent. So I learned a lot from him. When you drove for Bob Weikert, and you won a race, Victory Lane was entertaining for the fans. <laughs> what was it like for a young driver? to have the team owner out there saying he only ran half throttle next year. We're going to have, we're seven cylinders. Now we're going to have a, what was that like for a driver standing behind him while he's just riling the place up to the high heavens? Yes, sir. He, he would get him going. That's yep. for sure. Yeah. Uh, but that was great. You know, back then he would get on that microphone and you want to, and I didn't even, didn't even know it was coming. <laughs> that was, that was my problem at the beginning. I said, wow what did he just do you know and here comes the grandstands they're, they're cheering and rearing him on and some people loved him some people hated him but even the people that hated him i promise you they loved him because he was he made sprint car racing up here you take bob weikert al hamilton all them people they are they was dedicated to the sport and all the money that they spent they let them have their time you know i mean you don't get to victory lane every day so my opinion was it was great. I liked it, and he would get them roused up. He but, loved to stir the pot. Yes, and he put me on the spot. You know, oh. you know, you talk about stirring the pot. He put me on the spot, so he would get up there and he would say, "Y'all just wait till next week. You think this is something?" So I'm going, "Pappy, pappy," <laughs> but it was good. We Had come back and win again. You know. <laughs> Had to put the pressure on you yes, a little bit. And I want to talk about that, too. You know, Bob was all about winning. Uh, you know, he didn't really like to finish second. So what was it like the nights that you didn't end up in victory lane? Was there a, a chat at the end of the evening that he was like, what happened? No, ma'am. It was nothing like that. No, ma'am. It was unbelievable. He was behind you 100, 120% if you won, ran second, or ran 24th. Or maybe even tore it up. You know, he was the same. He uh, he had his cowboy boots on with the with the with the cow manure on it. He was happy and he was at the races watching his number twenty nine Wiker livestock. And just be safe is, was his biggest issue. He didn't want no one to get hurt. We could get. He said we could always get plenty of cars. So 
his biggest issue just don't get hurt. When you uh, looking at the numbers, nineteen eighty three, Port Royal, seventeen races, you won thirteen times. What was there about this track that obviously suited your style, and obviously suited the Wiker car as well? But what what was your 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 recollection of why you could just roll in here and win eighty percent of the races? Well, to, I I don't really know how to answer that right now, but. Uh, Believe it or not, we had a setup that would work just about anywhere we went. I, I would run that car. I would start with it a certain way at Williams Grove, Port Roll, Lincoln. It didn't matter where we was at. We and we had a great starting spot and uh, starting uh, spot on the car. You know, like the mm -hmm. setup and everything. Yeah. And it just we just worked from that. And if that motor would run and last us all night, we had a good chance to win. So. I don't know. I just, it, it just, you know, these tracks are really big. I wasn't even used to none of that. Yeah, I mean, they're humongous. <laughs> Indeed. And, you know, we talk about Bob and how awesome he was a, a car owner and very competitive. And I want to talk a little bit kind of your transition from the Weikert car into running for Gambler then um, after you were done racing for Bob. He was kind of the, the cheerleader behind you making the transition to a new owner. Ah uh, yes, um, you know that was a very tough decision for me to have to leave the Weikert car, and I sat down with Mister Weikert and asked him, you know, what do you suggest I do, and what would you like for me to do? And I don't want to leave, you know, I want to stay with you and keep driving and keep winning races. I mean, we got a good thing going, and um, but the pressure kept coming from Gambler Chassis Company, which was C.K. Spurlock, the owner, mm -hmm. and Kenny Jenkins again. That was a really good friend of mine and Mr. Weikert's. But uh, they wanted to go to World Outlaw Racing, and we, they wanted to, they put a nice, really good team together, and uh, they called it the house car. We did it for two years with Gambler. But as far as that decision, I, I didn't want to leave, but Pappy told me to, he, he didn't want to go racing. He liked to watch his car and stay at home and here in Pennsylvania. I said, okay. And um, he really cheered me on. And he even cheered me on during my whole career. I mean, he really did. He was even behind me. You know, he put bets on me. Him and Wolfgang used to, when they was racing together, he, him and Wolfgang would bet if I was going to win a certain race or Kendra was going to win. And uh, it was always Wolfie going against me, but Pappy would go for me. <laughs> so, you know, we, we go way back. That is really neat. The Gambler house car. Um it was kind of the beginning of the era. They'd been around for a couple of years, but what are the what were the what was the pressure? What was the challenge? Just just describe running that Gambler house car for those couple of years and what that was like for you. Well, it was there. We go again. I was racing for some great people, and it was very easy. Uh, they opened the door to me. They rolled out the red carpet. They let me and Kenny Woodruff just do what we wanted to do. You know, leave, they left us alone. They supplied us cars. They changed racing that era. Gambler Chassis Company come in that era, and, and believe it or not, I had one of the first ones with my father, like I said earlier. And then we got with Weikert, I was able to put three, three, four cars together, brand new for the '83 season. Mm -hmm. And they just changed the the just the the manufacturer, the the way that you could get parts. Now you know they had CNC machines. Instead of, you know, us having to make it at our own shop, now we could just call them and get parts. It was unbelievable. The technology. There was a gentleman there named Floyd Bailey. He was incredible. Welder, manufacturer, run machinery. Um, excuse me. <coughs> um, just, just the whole team. And, and, and the other big thing about that team was we was able to start running Ron Shaver Motors. Mm. He was from California. And C.K. Spurlock was already running some of his motors for the last two or three years. That helped our program more than anything. We could run a motor, and you didn't have to worry about it. Um, he would take care of them. Kenny would have taken care of them, the mechanic at that time. The motor program is what made that so easy or easier -er for us to keep racing. We race, used to race 120 times a year. I mean, go all over the country, never stop. We did this for 15 years. And um, 
So the motor issue was a big, 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 big help. We, we take things for granted today, um, especially back then. Traveling with the world of outlaws back in the day, no cell phones, no GPSs. <laughs> um, traveling the country, 120 races a year. You don't really get to come to home base. What was it like? And they don't have the rigs and the transporters that they have today. What was it like back then traveling with the world of outlaws, you know, making sure you had the parts necessary to hit those 120 races till you're able to get back to your home shop whenever that may be. What was that really like back then? Well, you know, back then is when, uh, man, I can remember we were just riding around in a dually truck and uh, some people had just flatbed trailers. Uh, right then at that era, the enclosed trailers started coming into the picture. But y'all can really believe it. I mean, I can remember Carl Kinzer and Elrod riding down the road. We would all ride, to, you know, run together down the highway or something. And everybody says, we didn't even, some people didn't even have air conditioner in their vehicle at that time. It's 115 degrees. They're riding down with the windows going down the road. Everybody's just trying to make it to the next place. Uh, you know, I, I used to just ride around in a van at the time. And then the, we had uh, we did get an enclosed trailer, and we thought we, was, you know, really, really had something, you know, which we did. It was nice. It was oh my goodness, and it was very nice. But it's come a long way. It's come a long way. The camaraderie was it. Um, you, you talk about Carl and Elrod. You talk about him traveling. Was there was there a lot of camaraderie amongst you, World of Outlaw drivers, or did? Uh, everyone stayed the, together or everyone stay separate. What, what was that like as you traveled around the country? And, you know, were you, were you social with these guys away from it? Or was it, was it mind your own business, tend to your, tend to your own business, your own team? Uh, pretty much myself. I, I, I stayed to myself. Mm -hmm. um, but I got along with everybody really well. I never had no issues with no one, believe it or not. Uh, we all raced hard. We all raced close together, you know, but – we was out for blood, and that's how we made our living. So you take Steve, Sammy, myself, Wolfgang, all of them, the Brad Doty. I mean, that's how we made our living. So we would race clean. There would be some, some circumstances that people would get in wrecks and stuff, you know. But that's going to happen, that's racing. But um, – We'd race really hard because, you know, everybody needed that dollar to get to the next place, and then that's how we put food on the table, put food on the table and everything. And believe it or not, off the racetrack, all those guys got together really good. But myself, I, I didn't really hang out with nobody. I still stayed to myself even off the racetrack because I was just so focused, I guess. I, I'm no, I don't know. I didn't. I look back now, and I doing this right now, I enjoy this more now than I did back then because I never had time to enjoy it. I can take all my wins, and I didn't even enjoy it. You know, I sit back and think now, like me and you was coming from the airport the other day, and I enjoy it now by looking back at everything I've done, but back then it was so much you had to, you had to get out of the car. You had to, all right, you get your picture taken with a checkered flag. Okay. People think, wow, that's the greatest thing in the world. Well, it is, but all I'm thinking about is, I got to drive 12 hours tonight. I'm going to drive all the way to Oklahoma City. We got to race tomorrow. We got to get this car ready, you know. So it was just a 24-hour ongoing, and it was a rough schedule, you know. And we would race either, even races without the outlaws. We'd go race other people, other places. We just, I guess we just ate up with it. <laughs> <laughs> And I've got to ask, though, you know, reminiscing and looking back on that, would you have changed that now, though? Because I feel like that focus and that drive is what made you successful. But would you have rather, looking back now, would you rather have changed that and enjoyed the moment? No, ma'am. I wouldn't change a thing. Uh, I learned so much. And, and racing, you have a lot of, lot, of, lot of things that go on with the racing. You have uh, – hydraulics you have fluid you have fuel you have motors you have oil you have you know you need to know you have to know a lot about everything so i learned a lot about that growing up at a young age and fortunate enough to uh you know just put it all together make it work but no ma'am i would not change a thing and i i'm never gonna look back 
one of the eras of your life that was it, it's interesting we could compare because you had a number of successful runs with successful team owners but from 1988 to 1992 casey luna uh that race car you won the world of outlaw championship won the king's royal along there and a lot of races um another famous car another historic car another epic car how did that all come about and and and, and racing with uh, in, in that car uh, yes, sir. That's a, that was a great car also. At the time, I was uh, racing for Paul Morgan in 1986 and 87, and we had two great years. Ken Jenkins, here we, Ken Jenkins started a, a, a company in Iowa called Challenger, uh, Challenger, Challenger Sprint Cars. He started building different cars like Gambler when he started there, but they're a little different. And he offered us cars. So he put this whole deal together for me and got me and Mr. Uh, uh, Morgan together, Paul Morgan. He was from Tampa, Florida. He had a company called Consolidated Credit. And he put me and him together. We was able to get Shaver Motors. We, put, You know, just same thing as what like I was really doing with, uh, with the Gambler House car. And I ran a Gambler House car, 84 and 85, and then I ran with Paul Morgan, 86 and 87. So I, here I go again. I have first-class stuff, first-class operation, right out of the box. We're winning. We're doing great. Uh, I think I ran second in the points again. And I believe, y'all, believe it or not, that, that year, 1986, I believe I ran 42 seconds. 42 seconds. Now, that's second behind Steve, second behind Wolfgang, Sammy, whoever it might have been. Now, we won our share. We won like 20 races. Mm -hmm. We won our share. But we ran 42 seconds. <laughs> and nobody's going to remember that except, <laughs> except me. Exactly right. <laughs> no one's going to remember that. And, and I still lost the points. Really? I almost won the points in 1986. Um, but I didn't. I, I had to miss a race. I got burned. At uh, at the Indianapolis Mile, uh, the oil filter, a rock come through the oil filter and caught the car on fire, going down the back straightaway, and I got burned really bad on my legs and my hands and everything. So uh, the heart, the the burn doctor at home in Memphis, he was taking care of my hands and everything, got them all back together. But I had to miss one race, and that put me behind, and Steve ended up winning that year also, and I ended up second. Again. But uh, that was an amazing year, too. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and in 1987, same thing. We, But believe it or not, I went back to Gambler Cars in 1987 with Paul Morgan. And this is how, yes, uh, 87, that was right. And then 88, I was racing with Paul Morgan again. And uh, about April or May, maybe March or April of 88, he wasn't able to really do it no more. You know, he wanted to slack about, slack off and kind of get out of it. So I said, no problem, you know. Uh, no hard feelings. Just, I understand. You know, it's tough. It's rough sometimes. So the 10 car was out there racing. Kenny Woodruff was doing the mecha uh, being a mechanic on it and everything. So I called Kenny and wanted to know what their plans was for the rest of the 88 season. And they're, they're beyond, you know. And then he said they really didn't have no plans. They was just Kenny, uh, uh, I think Jack Hodgshaw drove it for a little while. Uh, Danny Lasowski drove it for a little while. You know, they was just kind of jumping drivers around. And I said, well, what do you think about me and you getting back together and we'll just try to forward, forward out and see if we can make it happen. The challenge of the Ford, what was, did, did you, was that a, a, a major concern for you or did you like the challenge of a Ford in, in what was a Chevrolet world? Yes, it was a Chevrolet world, but it, I loved the challenge. I thought that was greatest, you know, because I wanted to put that thing on the map, that Ford car, the Ford motor, Casey Luna. I wanted to put all that on the map for them. And when I look back, when I started driving that car, this, this car right here, with this big block in it, this is the same type of. I would run the same setup, even uh, even back then, because the Ford motor that we have is a lot heavier than the Chevrolets, even though it was aluminum block and everything. 
it weighed like a steel block Chevrolet. So it was heavy like this car. In the center of the gravity, I ran this, this motor right here. I ran this car lower than most people did with the motor height. So I basically just started that car the same way. And it would just took right off. Me and Kenny had success right away. I think the second night we won Hopstop, Indiana. We ran second to Steve at Bloomington the first night right away. So we hit it off great. Well, we talk about the motors, but I also want to go to the chassis side of things. You know, running with Gambler and, and switching back and forth. Was there one that you favorited, you know, just because you had more success with it or you were more comfortable with it? I mean, back then I'm sure things were still rather close, but there was still probably a bunch of difference as well. Oh, yes, ma'am. No question. The Gambler Chassis Company, uh, they made first-class operation. I, there was a gentleman there that welded those cars up. I got to know him really, really well. I trusted them so much. And all the technology that they brought to sprint car racing and Floyd Bailey with his knowledge, it was, on, it was like night and day having a, a, a Gambler car back then. And even today, if they was in... They would be the same way today. Yes, I ran good with the Challenger cars, but I, I'm, I'm a definitely a gambler man. <laughs> Tell us uh, about 1989 uh, from, a, from a championship. You won the World of All Championship, won the King's Royal race along the way. Uh, you're with Casey Luna. Um, what, what's your recollections of that season? What's your, what's your recollections of that season? Yes, sir, that was a good year. Um, we won our share of races with Outlaws. We won the World Outlaw Championship. We did win the King's Roll. Uh, 1988, I almost won the Knoxville Nationals in the 10 car. Uh, in 1987, I ran second at, at the Nationals, Knoxville. 1988, with the Lunar car, we ran second. And um, 1989 was a Amazing year. Wolfgang had an amazing year that year also with the 8D car. So me and him was back and forth, back and forth. He'd win, I'd run second. He'd, I'd win, he'd run second. And um, we finally got the championship that year. Casey Luna won it for him, won it for the Ford. Uh, he was very proud, you know, and I was, I was more proud for them than myself, you know. Uh, I've been really close so many times, but I finally got to do it and finally got to win it. And um, it was just a great year. You won the uh, King's Royal. Uh, King's Royal, part of the lore of it is $50,000 in cash. Uh, Donnie Kreitz has a great story about a professional <laughs> wrestling buddy friend of his in a suitcase carrying the money out of there. Uh, what was your $50,000 in cash story? Uh, yes, sir. I, I, I want to just say how rough a night that was for us. <laughs> good, yeah. um, believe it or not, we qualified really good, and, and you get penal, you get penalized for qualifying really good, you know. So they start to the fast the cars back in the heat race. So I did not make it through the transfer spot in my heat race, so I had to run the B the semi the qualifying race, in which I got to start on the front row of the B feature, and I led every lap. So that was 15 laps. Um. So here we go. I got started on. I got my time back. So I got started on the front row of the A feature for the King's Roll. I led every lap of that. So that's 40 laps. So then I just ran 15 laps. So that's 55 laps. At Eldora. At Eldora, I just ran back to back. Got about a 10-minute break in between, right? And my little arms, they was just, I was tired. <laughs> I was tired. So my wife said, well, I was signing autographs, taking a picture, and I said, well, you just go up there and, you know, take care. Go up there and see them, get the money and all that. Well, she comes back, believe it or not, with $50,000 in, in a Twinkie box. So that's how we got paid, in a Twinkie box. It was great. Was there any I Twinkies said, in there? No, no, there was no room for Twinkies. Didn't even get a wrapper. So um, we'll take it however we can get it. I love it. I love it. You know, Earl, he's great. <laughs> Bobby, is there any other memorable, you know, moment of your career that you're that really sticks out to you in in all that you have accomplished? Well, you know, I guess my favorite year of racing would have to be right here with the Wiker car. I love the I love that Wiker family. I love the people that was helping me. 
people don't understand this, but there's two two gentlemen here that was local people that that's who helped me on the race car. Uh, Kenny Kenny Hammond and a gentleman named Ron Zook. And Mr. Weikert, let's, yeah, I'm going to throw him in there right now, too. But those people right there, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. That's cool stuff. Really, really cool. You rolled along, ran your own sprint car for a little bit after the after the uh, Casey Luna era. And you even tried NASCAR. Tell us about your NASCAR experience. <laughs> well, it didn't get very far. <laughs> um, yes, sir, I did. At the time... I, I put my, my own little sprint car team together, the number four car. I said, okay, I'm going to just hit all the big races, go race when I want to. That gave me the opportunity to, to hang out with the Childress and the Hendrix. And, you know, I know Jeff Gordon. I know Jeff Gordon's stepdad. I'm, uh, so I was able to hang out with all those people, just trying to get something together to make an opportunity to race. And it just... It got real close one time. I was thought of me and um, John Andretti. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, John Andretti. We thought we was going to do. He was. He had a Bush car at the time. They called it the Bush Series. And uh, I got really close to to being able to maybe get with him, but his sponsorship just really didn't work out for him either. So, uh, you know, I. I and I just told myself back then, look, if I can't do it right, I don't want to do it at all because I don't been spoiled. These these people that was behind me gave me a hundred percent. They always gave me great equipment. Yes, I won the races. I worked hard. I did all that, but I couldn't have done it without good equipment. You know, you have to have. You need good stuff. And so I just really told myself. I said, okay, I'm not going to do it if I can't race with Richard Childress, Hendrix, a good team. I'm not, I don't want to just go out here and ride around. So I didn't get to even ride around, so I just washed my hands from it and uh, started doing something else. Ideally, your 20-year-old self, what was your ultimate goal with racing? Was it to go IndyCar? Was it to go NASCAR and be successful? I mean, what did you want to see yourself doing? Oh, yes. Uh, most definitely, just be a, a famous race car driver. At the time, you know, we all thought we was going to be IndyCar drivers. You know, yeah, man, I want to go to Indianapolis 500. I want to go race the Indy cars. And then the the Winston Cup, the NASCAR thing was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So that was even looking better for us. So uh, it didn't really matter to me which way. I even tried to, uh, Mr. Luna with the tent car. He even put me together a Trans Am race. We raced out in Sonoma, California. One of his buddies from Al Albuquerque, New Mexico, he had a Trans Am car, and it was a Roush car. They painted it up like our tin car and everything. We went to Sonoma. Uh, the Roush people helped. It was a Mustang. had the Ford motor in it. And um, we raced that race uh, at, at the road course. And it had Case Luna on it. had the tin. You know, it was, it was beautiful. And uh, the, the Roush people just helped us a lot with all that. And that was... That was all I really got to do. I never got to race no uh, Bush cars or NASCAR or nothing. What was it like for a dirt track racer to go road racing? Oh, it was great. It's no different. Uh, I used to, you got to just turn left, turn right, go uphill, downhill, shift, and it's just, uh, it's a race car. You know, I remember racing go-karts back then. I raced asphalt, uh, road, little road courses, dirt tracks. It didn't matter. Uh, I loved to race. And I wish I could go right now and do it, you know. <laughs> well, we might know some people that might make it happen. I love it. We, t we talk about that, you know, the transitioning through your career. And unfortunately, all good things come to an end at some point. Um, how was that for you, just being a driven race car driver and your focus and your love and passion for the sport? Was it a cuddle, ties, I'm done, this is over, never again? Or were you like, mm, maybe we can dabble with this later on? Uh, yes, ma'am. That, that, was, that was really a tough decision. I got fortunate enough to, when I got, decided to quit racing, that um, I was able to race my little four car, my own little car, a couple, you know, all the big shows and few races. 
And then uh, I raced some 360 cars. I was able, the ASCS mm -hmm. was getting really big at this time. Mm -hmm. And they started racing the 360 cars, smaller motors. Well, in our area, like uh, Texas, Tennessee, Oklahoma, they was, uh, you know, you could go race twice a weekend, and then you'd be home all week. Well, that was that was pretty cool, you know, I thought. And uh, at the same time, my father, he had a, a electrical company in town, in Memphis. And he's been after me for several years, to start coming helping him with the company and everything and uh which you know he he's a big reason where i'm at today too you know he started me off in racing gave me everything i does everything i needed to get started and then he even offered me a job come help me with the electrical companies so uh, me and my wife we just sat down and said okay what do you want to do you know you want to quit or and i'll go to work for him and help him out and so basically that's what i did and when I called it quits, I quit. I just, I sold everything I had left. I didn't even keep my toolbox. Yeah. Only thing I have as far as racing is is my trophies and all my helmets and stuff like that. But now I did give one of my cars to the Hall of Fame, one of my four cars, to the Knoxville Hall of Fame. And um, that was great. I love doing that. That was exciting. You mentioned, you know, something just struck me, and I didn't even think about this until just a moment ago. Memphis, talk about a hotbed of sprint car racing. Mm -hmm. Why was that? Why Why is that? It's still it's still stout. Oh, yes, sir. We have, they're still racing there right now at West Memphis, Arkansas. And believe it or not, really, really, just like here in Pennsylvania, you have, you have 12 to 15, 20 people that's come out of the Memphis area that was dominant. You take Sammy, Ricky Hood, Jeff Swindell, uh, Lee Brewer back in the day. Um, there's a gentleman there that people don't even recognize. His name is Eddie Gallagher. He has won probably 20 championships there, and he gets no credit. Gets no credit. You know, his name's just never been out there. But this guy is talented. He's still winning championships. He's older than I am. He won the championship again this past year. Uh, Terry Gray. Y'all yeah. probably remember Terry Gray. Know Terry. You can go down a list. So um, it's just like the the central Pennsylvania guys. There's a lot of them there, a lot of them there. And then California. Let's just take California, for example. You got the Cadings. You got the Tim Greens. You got the Jimmy Seals. Man, I had to race all them people, you know. And and they was tough. They was tough. And But, believe you know, everybody just really took me underneath my wing underneath their wing and great people i i won't never forget them all all the owners down the road all the drivers they was great bobby thanks for your time we appreciate you spending time with us all right thank you for being here and i really appreciate the weikerts having me here and uh maybe i'll get to drive this thing around uh <laughs> I, maybe uh the start of the feature tonight or something there you, there you go, go. Good. thank Love you it. all right you got it.